This program is made possible by the partners and friends of Bob Yandian Ministries. Coming up on this episode of Student of the Word. How should we pray toward the world? How should we pray for the things of the world? Again, we can't change the world, but how are we to pray for the people in the world? And we're told in the Word of God to pray for people that come to know Jesus. Pray for yourself that you'll know how to handle those that come to you and especially depend on the Holy Spirit. Did you know the baptism, the infilling of the Holy Spirit was not just made for your prayer life? Not just made so you can come to church and prophesy? For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Welcome, welcome to Student of the Word with Pastor Bobby Andy. I'm so glad to have you here today. I was just thinking about that when I call myself pastor. You know, people say, should we still call you pastor since you don't have a church? Well, the answer is yes. Past presidents are still called president. But I like to think of it this way. I really haven't left my church. You are my church. The ones that consistently watch each and every day. We have visitors that come. Sometimes you stay, sometimes you leave. Others that come and go, wow, this is great. And they stick around. And I like to think of it, even when I had my own church here in town, I had the best church in the world. And you say, well, I don't think that's true. Well, then don't, you know, don't, don't try to convince me not. If you say, well, your head's stuck in the sand, well, leave it there. You know, you're, well, you're, you know, you're ignorant. Well, then let me stay ignorant. I think I had the best church in town. I think right now of the entire television network around the world, I know it sounds a little prideful. I think I have the best audience in the world. I think you are the best group of people in the world. And I just like teaching it to you. I like the fact that people's, People understand the more they know of the word of God, they begin to rise out of the average Christian person. Not that you're something special. Anybody can do this if they listen to the word of God because the word of God brings a stability and a maturity to your life that even other Christians notice it. I trust that's what's happening in your life. Those of you who've been watching for a year, a couple of years, because what you're getting over and over again is the word, the word, the word, the word. And Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. You will know the truth and the truth will continue to make you free. Oh yeah, you're set free when you get bored again, but there's a freedom that comes from understanding the word of God. So it simply comes back to this too. If you're a faithful member of this congregation, why don't you just pitch in? You know, I'm not asking for your tithes, that belongs in the local church you attend, but I am asking for some of your offering that you'll take and send it in to help raise up a whole new generation of ministers and also disciples for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's my calling, that's my mission. If you'd like to become a partner with me, join those others who are partners with me, just like in my physical church I had at one time, my local church, I had the consistent givers that you could always count on, a certain amount of money being there at all times to operate with, that's what you make. You make that consistency in this ministry that is so much a part of the kingdom of God, but also my natural security lies in that area of the of those who are called to stand with me. Go to my website, bobyandian.com, and you can become a partner with me in this giving into this ministry, bobyandian.com. We started a series yesterday for a couple of days. It might extend for another day. I don't know. We'll just see how far this goes. And it's called The World. And what about the world? And uh, what are we supposed to do with the world system around us? Today, we're going to talk about who controls the world. We took up yesterday in this series two things. Number one, there are two churches and there are two worlds. There's a church within the church. The church is those that are born again around the world, but within the church is local churches. Also, the world. The world is a world within the world. The world itself around us is worldwide. It's a system around the world, but there's people in the world. Jesus didn't die for the world system. He died for the people in the world system. And that's what we come back to with the word world. Two definitions for the church, the universal church and the local church. Two definitions for the world, the universal world around us, the world system, the, the system we can feel around us, the, 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 the agenda the world has. That's the world system, but in within it are the people of the world. That's who Jesus died for. And why did he save them? To take them out of the world and put them into the church. That's the whole purpose. In Adam all die, in Christ shall all be made alive. Who controls the world? We know Jesus controls the church. Satan controls the world. First John chapter five and verse 19 says this. We know that we are of God. 
And the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. The whole world, here's the world system. And under the sway of the wicked one, that is Satan himself. We cannot expect morality and a moral improvement in the world. If we could change the entire world system and change it into a moral system, these people would not go to heaven. They would still go to hell because why? There are many moral sinners, religious sinners. We will not change the world and Jesus will not win the lost. We do momentarily affect the world, but we can't change the world system, but we can change the people in the world. That's the blood of Jesus Christ, the plan of redemption. That's the gospel we preach to them. This age, as all ages before, until Jesus returns are under Satan's control and has set itself against God and will not change. One little girl came to me one time crying in a church. Her mother was there. And her mother said, would you just talk to my little girl? She is praying for the devil to get saved. She has such a concern that he that she doesn't want Satan. I said, honey, I'm sorry about this, but you know what? There's certain people that will never accept Jesus, but also Satan will never, ever turn. That's why the Bible talks about it. I said, honey, set your uh, faith on things that can be changed, people's lives around you. And don't be so concerned about that because it's all under God's control. One day you'll understand, but in the meantime, put it into God's hands. Well, the tears dried up and she was better after that point. Don't know where she is today, but at least she was better at that point. Like Satan, the world cannot be redeemed. Like Satan, the world will always hate the church and hate the nation of Israel, the two major things on God's agenda. Israel in Jerusalem and also the church, and neither one will be destroyed. It is just as useless to pray for the world to change as it is to pray for Satan to be changed. Both are unchangeable. Our mission to the world is called the Great Commission. It's a twofold mission, evangelism and discipleship. Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16 give us evangelism. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. The gospel is the simple plan of salvation. Put your faith and trust in Jesus. Believe that God raised him from the dead and you'll be saved. And whosoever believes will be saved. This is converts. Whoever believes not will be damned. These are those who are condemned. So there's two responses to the gospel when we take it to the world. Some will be saved, some will not. The majority will not be saved, but those who do believe in Jesus Christ will find eternal life. But then the second part of the Great Commission, Jesus gave both of these at the same time. It's just that Mark recorded the first part and Matthew recorded the second part. In verses 19 and 20 of Matthew 28, Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. After they're saved, discipleship comes next. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. We are left here to sow good seeds. Satan sows evil seeds and produces tares. Tares look like wheat. But Matthew chapter 13 tells us this in verse 24 through verse 30, that Satan is here and sows tares. And listen, I thought it was interesting in that particular parable because those that worked in the field came to the master and said, should we start pulling up the tares? He said, oh, no, no, wait for the day of the harvest. On the day of the harvest, the wheat and the tares will be separated. It's not up to us to go ripping tares out of this earth. It's up to us to keep winning souls, keep making people... Uh, uh, believers and the next of all, making people into disciples for the Lord Jesus Christ. The eventual separation of all the wheat and tares will come when Jesus Christ comes back to set up his kingdom on the earth. The church is being built with people removed out of the world, called out of the world. In fact, the word church again means the called out ones. And so the church is being built by people who jump off this ship onto this ship, off the sinking ship to the ship that cannot be sunk. And again, most of the people stay on this ship over here and go down with it. But God talked about those that find the narrow path, the narrow gate will jump onto this ship and find Jesus Christ. It's up to us to pull up next to the world and simply say, we've been called out, but you can jump off of there onto here and you can be called out too and become a member of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the called out ones. The church are not only called out from uh, Satan and his kingdom, but also the world and its system. And this comes by the word of God. Once a person is born again, their obligation is turned to the word of God. The object for the sinner is Jesus Christ. Put your faith and trust in him. But the object once you're born again is the word of God. And Jesus said that in his prayer when he said to the father, sanctify them. Sanctify means once they've been born again, they move into maturity. 
They take the salvation in here and display it before the world. He said, sanctify them through your word. He said, your word is truth. John 17, six, I have manifested your name to the men you have given to me out of this world. I love this verse, Acts 15, 14. Simon, that's Peter, has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles, that's all the heathen, to take out of them a people for his name. Notice this, to take them out. This is again the purpose and the meaning of the word church and the purpose and the meaning of evangelism is to take people out of the world and bring them into the kingdom of God. Again, God hates the world system, but loves the people in the world. Jesus died for the people of the world in the world. Next of all, we have this, we will never win the whole world. I hear this all the time. People say, well, we're gonna win our whole city to Jesus. Well, no, you're not. It's not gonna end up that way. Jesus even said it, so why would you def- why would you come against what he has to say? I understand it's a good mantra. It's a good thing to say to your people, we're gonna win this city for the Lord, but we really need to be honest and say, we're gonna win our part of the city for this, for the word of God. We're gonna win them to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're gonna find those who have an open heart toward him. Multitudes too large to count will go to heaven. Revelation chapter seven and verse nine says, after these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, people, and tongues standing before the throne of God before the Lamb, clothed with white robes with palm branches in their hands, but more will go to hell than go to heaven. Matthew 7, I've quoted this, but let's just take a look at the verse itself. Verse 13 and 14 of Matthew. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Verse 14, but narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to eternal life. And there are few by comparison who find it. Now we found out in heaven, it's an innumerable group of people, but that huge group of people by comparison of the world is few because more people will end up going to hell than go to heaven. But the beauty of it is, is God has always had a remnant. What is a remnant? In the world, there's a group of people that will respond to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And once they do and become a Christian, they form a remnant in this earth. It's never the whole world, it's a remnant. But God is delighted all the time to take a few people and defeat many. I see it back there with Gideon. God kept whittling down the army, down the army till we finally had 300 and those 300 defeated 30,000. What God, God can do with a few people. I mean, just one or two can change. David had a small ragtag army, but they went against five armies and defeated all of them. Romans chapter nine, verse 27 and 28 says this, Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sands of the sea, the remnant will be saved. He was talking about the nation of Israel. Not all of Israel will be saved. Not all Jews will be saved. A number of them will like any other nation and any other group of people. But God has a special blessing on the nation of Israel and especially the believers that will occupy it from the time that the tribulation is over into the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. I have more to say and it'll be right after halftime. You can find out how you can be blessed by this series that we're offering on the world. The Bible says we are in the world, but not of the world. But what is God's attitude toward the world. Should we pray for the world to change? As Christians, our job is not to save the world. Our job is to win souls, to transfer people out of the world and into the church. In this series titled, The World, Bob Yandian defines what the world system is and what the role of the church is today. The World series is available for $25 plus shipping and handling. To order, visit our website at bobbyendian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership.
God has always had a remnant. We talked about this just before halftime, just before the break. And God has always had a remnant. Again, the verse says in Romans chapter 9, verse 27 and 28, Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant shall be saved. Not all of Israel is really Israel. Not all the nation accepts Jesus as Lord and Savior. But that's not only true for Israel, it's true for us. Romans 9, 6. It is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. He's also applying this to the church. Not everybody that cries out to Jesus really is trusting in him and gets saved. It's gonna be interesting because the Bible says, as when the Lord comes back, many will say, didn't we cast out devils in your name? Didn't we do him many wonderful deeds? He'll say, I never knew you, depart from me. You might say, well, how in the world can somebody cast out devils and do wonderful deeds and acts and not be saved? Because they didn't quote the fact that they believed in Jesus, they quoted their works. Didn't we do these wonderful works? Didn't we cast out? Listen, because you can cast out a devil, the seven sons of Sceva proved that. Because you can work in league with the devil and make it look like you're casting out devils doesn't mean you have God. Isaiah 46 and verse three says this, listen to me, O house of Jacob and all the remnant of the house of Israel. You ever notice this? Israel's called by two names, many times the word of God, house of Jacob, house of Israel. Jacob was his name before he was saved and Israel was his name after he was saved. And this is what the nation is. Even the nation of Israel is not all filled with believers. Jesus proved that when he was here, but yet many Jews gave their lives to Jesus while he was there and while he was here in this earth. So again, within the nation, we have unbelievers, house of Jacob, believers, house of Israel. Romans 11.5, even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom. Didn't we prophesy in your name, cast out devils? I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. The Christian's attitude toward the world should be this. First John chapter two, verses 15 through 17, listen, the book of 1 Corinthians and into 2 Corinthians deals much with what our attitude toward the world should be. John also draws the comparison of the world as opposed to the church. And again, not the people of the world. The world system is what he's talking about, which will never change, just like the church will never change. It's the system of the world will never change till Jesus comes and destroys it. 1 John 2, verse 15 through 17, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. He's talking to Christians here. He's simply saying, if you love the world, you can't love the Father. He didn't say you're not born again. Love for the Father comes by the word of God. Verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world is passing away. Listen to that. The world is passing away. Where we're going to save the world? No, you're not. Not the world system. Where we're going to change the hope? No, you're not. The world is passing away. That's slowly, day by day, it's spiraling down. The world is passing away and the lusts of it, but he who loves the word of God and does the will of God will abide forever. Wow, that's a great verse of scripture, isn't it? Jesus set an example of how we are to pray for the world. I love this in John 17. Take a look at verses 9 through 25. This is a great, this is out of Jesus' prayer before he was arrested uh, after this prayer and this night was over. John 17 verse 9 through 25 says this, Jesus praying to the Father says, I pray for them. Them who? Them disciples. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world. Oh, underline that phrase. We are not to pray for the world. It will never change. We pray for the people in the world to be born again. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me. Those you've given me are those that are yet to be saved and those that are saved right now, for they are yours. And all mine are yours and yours are mine and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but those are in the world. These are in the world, those that surround me. In other words, they're in the world, but not of it. Those that you've given me, the 12 disciples minus one, those disciples, those that will follow me later are in the world and I have come to you. Holy Father, keep or guard them through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was in them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you have given to me, I have kept, 
None of them is lost except for the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. He's speaking here of Judas. But now I come to you that these things that I speak in the world that I may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. The world will always hate you. The world system will always despise you. You'll never be able to please them. Quit taking your church and trying to please the world system. Please God. That's the main thing of what we're called to do. Sometimes we'll please the world, sometimes we will not. Where these two worlds, where the world and the church come together at times, there's some things in the world we can line up with. We can talk about morality, things like that, but we're gonna preach the word of God. And most of the time we will be opposed to what the world is doing. The world is headed one direction, we're headed the opposite direction. The world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. Quit praying, oh, rapture come any minute, get me out of here. He says, I don't pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Take those who are believers and make them more dedicated to you. And how do they do it? Through the truth of the word of God. What this broadcast is dedicated to, the truth of the word of God, stability, No more will the world be able to knock you off your feet because you're strong in the things of God. Your word is truth in verse 17. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but for those who will believe in me through their word. I don't just pray for these disciples, but those that will be saved afterwards through their preaching, that they may be one as you, Father, you in me, I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. This is the people in the world. And the glory which you have given me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, you in me, that they may be perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am and they may behold my glory, which you have given me. They're gonna come to heaven one day for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous father, the world has not known you, but I have known you and these have known that you have sent me. Wow, what an incredible thing, that verse of scripture. Let's talk about a summary here from these verses of scripture. How should we pray toward the world? How should we pray for the things of the world. Again, we can't change the world, but how are we to pray for the people in the world? And we're told in the word of God to pray for people to come to know Jesus. Pray for yourself that you'll know how to handle those that come to you and especially depend on the Holy Spirit. Did you know the baptism, the infilling of the Holy Spirit was not just made for your prayer life? not just made so you can come to church and prophesy. No, the main reason why the Holy Spirit was given and the baptism or the infilling of the Holy Spirit was given, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit was given so that what? We can win those to the Lord. He said that when you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit's come upon you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. God not only saved us, but gives us supernatural ability to win souls. We win them through the truth of the word of God, but we win them by the power of the Holy Spirit. Did you know Jesus didn't win two people the same way? Everyone was one different. Why do we try to reduce witnessing down to a formula, down to four points or something? Everybody can use these to win souls. Oh, they'll win some souls. But the greatest thing you can have is to be filled with the Holy Spirit and understand the gifts of the Spirit, the main operation of the gifts of the Spirit are to help me win souls. Jesus used word of knowledge just about more than any other thing to win people. I mean, he talked to Nathaniel, I saw you sitting under a tree. Boy, that must have shook him. He told the woman at the well, you've had five husbands. The one you're living with now is not your husband. She said, you must be a prophet. That shows the people, this is the Holy Spirit and bring draw them in even more than just your testimony. We are to pray for open doors for the spreading of the gospel. We are to pray for sinners to respond to the gospel. For those who will hear the gospel to be saved, for sinners to receive Jesus, then come out of the world. We're to pray for the blinders to be removed from the eyes of sinners so they can see and have a clear choice. Second Corinthians chapter four, verses three and four says this, if our gospel is hidden, 
it's hidden to those that are lost, in whom the God of this world, there he is, the one that backs the world system, the God of this world system has blinded the minds of them who do not believe, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ might shine. You know what your prayer should be? Father, I pray as I'm witnessing to this person that that person, the blinders will be removed off of them. The partial blindness that comes on them from the world system is blocked for a moment to where they can, by the power of the Holy Spirit, perceive what I'm gonna be ministering to them. How should we pray toward the church? Just like Jesus prayed in that prayer, we pray for Christians to evangelize, for workers to go into the world, more to be called and more to accept the call. Matthew 9, verse 37 and 38 says this. He said, the harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. What should we be praying? Not only for open doors for me, not only for wisdom for me, not only for an anointing for me, not only for the gifts of the spirit to operate through me, but Lord, to call more people into the harvest that they too will depend on the power of the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray for their converts to grow, to become disciples, attend church, grow in the word of God, and then become great witnesses for the world around us. How do we pray for our nation, government leaders? Proverbs 29 and verse two, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice, but when the wicked rule, the people groan. Until Jesus comes back, we'll have some righteous in office, but we'll have many wicked in office. One day, the eternal righteous one will be in office. His name is Jesus Christ. In closing, let me tell you how we pray for our leaders according to the New Testament. First Timothy chapter two, verses one through four. I exhort first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, specifically for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men, this includes those in leadership, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the full knowledge of the truth. What are we to pray for? We often pray for all these things they have in front of them, for wisdom, for all, and that's fine. But what's the main prayer we should be praying for everyone of the Republicans, the Democrats, those in office, our Supreme Court, our president? What should we be praying for leaders? We should pray for them, first of all, that they will be saved and then come to the full knowledge of the truth. What is that? It is the Great Commission. Pray for them, first of all, to receive Jesus, then next of all, to become disciples for the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the beauty of it. You know what? I'm just going to continue this tomorrow. We're going to keep on going on this particular subject of what is the world and how do we approach it? How do we deal with it? See you tomorrow. Ministers, you can access valuable resources free at ministersclub.com. You'll find topical studies, sermon outlines, PDF books, answers to many questions, and plenty of encouragement, all free. Just go to ministersclub.com. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.